What's up, everyone, and welcome into the Buffalo Sports Collective. It is Friday, April 28th, 2023. As always, I am PK alongside my co-host, Phil. Phil, I know this is going to be airing on Friday, but happy draft day to you. Yeah, uh, I'm going to foreshadow that I likely fall asleep before the Bills pick because the Bills are now just too good. I... I will absolutely take, I'm not, you know, going to be dramatic and say that I would not rather have the season glory and the playoffs, obviously, over some draft day fun. But to think that I didn't slightly enjoy the top 10 picks back in the day and what are the Bills going to do? We're going to trade. I mean, we were actually in the talks and conversations of all the kind of lead up of draft day and all the fun things going around it because we were always terrible. And uh, the Bills would always be, you know, in in the top 10 or around there. And it was exciting. And you got to watch them before 1130 p.m. And now it's I mean, I I might try. I might watch a little bit of it, but I will likely wake up and read plenty of analytical posts on what the Bills did or if the Bills traded up and out of the first round altogether. I was going to say, imagine if you stay up, you're actually up at 1130. Bills are on the clock. And they trade. That's back. that's How would the you most feel? like How would you feel? terrifying thing I think as just like you wasted your entire every like I, I could have been sleeping that whole time and then just to see the Bills trade out of the first it's literally a wasted evening of something I, I would be very frustrated and I don't think I'd be too frustrated if the Bills in general popped out of the first round but. I, if I stayed up specifically un, until that time and watched them trade back, I'd be very upset. See, Phil, this is why I am a two-time fantasy champion, and uh, you you haven't won one yet because you're not dedicated to the research you need. These are the future like champions of fantasy football being drafted tonight, and you just would rather sleep. We can't even draft most of the players picked in the first round. <laughs> Well, yeah, but the players that you can, like, well, I don't even know if Bijan's going to go in the first round, but he's a superstar. He's he's going to be like a top five guy. Don't listen to this. Don't draft him in the upcoming fantasy draft next year. Yeah, but we also have months and months and months of other people who do this for a true living and make a lot of money to tell me who to pick. That's very true. That is very true. So uh, if you want to join Phil and take a nap or me and stick up all night and watch all 31 picks now and not 32 because Miami are a bunch of cheaters, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Buffalo Sports Collective and on Twitter at Buffalo Sports Co. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our website at buffalosportscollective.com. Phil's got his newest breakdown article out on the website from the Bandits game, the epic game that was with the Toronto Rock. You can read that there. And check for the time breakdowns in the description of the show. Phil, Wednesday, we aired our draft that as people are listening to this now, I think you can still vote for like another six hours as this is coming out now. I think the last poll closes around noon, but it was our second anniversary of our first show or regular scheduled shows ever. So we put out that fun little draft, but we wanted to thank everyone once again on this main show. Phil, past two years have been a blast doing this with you and producer Pat, who is always behind the scenes. Brooke, thank you for all the time you've afforded me to do this fun little idea we had. And to the listeners, thank you for spending any bit of your own time listening to us talk. It was a fun idea we put together, and we just ran with it. And the support we have gotten is unmatched, and we couldn't be more appreciative of it. You just spending any amount of time, even if it's just like the intro because you like the music and then you turn it off, I don't care. You gave a little bit of a time for us, and we couldn't be more happy about it and thankful for it. Yeah, pretty much echoing everything you said. It's been, I don't, I don't know if it's been, I it, it, yeah, it's been more work than I think either of us really anticipated this oh, being. Yeah. I'm not saying that we thought it'd be extremely easy, but it's it's a lot more consuming of our lives than I think either of us really expected it to get to, especially after two years. So like you said, uh, I'd like to thank Ashley as well for affording me the time to record and write articles and do everything it is that we do because it does take up quite a lot of our time doing uh doing this but we do enjoy it that's why we've been doing it for two years and like you said we have the listeners to thank i mean we are growing every single year i mean it's only been two but we're still growing which is a positive sign and 
like you said, anyone who's even spent a little bit of time listened to even one episode, we will absolutely take it or even talk to us on social media and wh- whatever. I mean, any kind of interaction, we love it. It's why we do it. And that is what we are here for, for at least one one more year. Is that what we got renewed for? Yeah, we're at least one more year. I know they're probably by end of year three, they're going to do it by month by month basis. But <laughs> they give know, us one, we're, one more full coasting. year, then they're they're cutting the leash. We're like those uh, renters that never miss a payment, but they're always like, yeah, do we really want these guys sticking in our building? It's always like that. But going back to what you said about like the the amount of time that this is involved, I remember our friend Cam asked us about everything with podcasting and all that kind of stuff. And we pretty much said, no matter how much work you think it's going to be, add a little bit more to it because there's so much stuff behind the scenes rather than just jumping behind a microphone and talking we're hoping you know by the way our numbers are growing maybe like uh two or three more years that's being gracious probably like five or six we'll be able to have somebody that puts all this stuff together somebody that adds edits and all like i've been telling you for two years now phil my main goal and my main mission for this podcast is one day that you and I can just show up to the studio, record, and then bounce. We don't have to worry about editing. We don't have to worry about social media. Social media is my kryptonite, Phil. I hate social media. I hate doing it. But eventually one day, we won't have to do it. And that's the goal. And if our number... The only way we're going to be able to do that is you listeners keep growing and tell your friends and family to listen to us. Because, uh, yeah, the, the more listeners we get, the more chances are that Phil and I can just dedicate an hour of our time rather than two hours each recording night and then hours on end the other days of the week to uh, put all this stuff together with jobs on top of it yeah with jobs on top of it <laughs> that that's the tough part i mean if we didn't have you know if we could just not make money or pay bills that then we'd be all right we could do everything we just said but uh turns out that's still an important part of life i mean apparently i don't i don't know yeah we haven't tried not doing that that's true i don't i don't, I don't think we should but we haven't tried it so can't knock it till you try it but we'll move on to the first team that tried to knock it good segue i guess the buffalo bisons tuesday they won two to one first game of the abs system the automatic balls and strike system uh I haven't really heard any complaints about it. It's just in AAA, and they're only doing it the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday game, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they're going back to the regular umps until I think May is when they're fully incorporating it. But Lawrence went three innings pitched, two hit ball. Hatch came in three innings pitched, one earned run. And then Wednesday, it's another back-and-forth game, Phil. This is like the third time in a row, I think it is. Uh, They lost two to one. So same score, just reversed it. Zulu struggled again. In uh, He had a nice first inning, but then in total, way too many walks, way too many walks in general in this game. Fraze, in his first AAA appearance, went three innings pitch, one earned run, but he did walk three guys. Zulu walked four. Phil, what are your thoughts on these first two games in this series? Well, I mean, we did mention walks on uh, the last episode, and here we are once again. I mean, it was good to see Zulu. Only one hit is great. Again, the walks are terrible, but Two innings, only one earned run, and obviously the earned runs still include his walks. They don't count as errors or anything, so if you put him on, he could have allowed them in. So, I mean, the positive with that is even though he did walk four people, which is way too many, he only allowed one hit and only one run still in two innings. So, he limited his damage is the big thing, especially for a young pitcher. If you get yourself in trouble, it's how do you get out of it without allowing it to just implode the entire game or yourself. So, I think for Zulu... That's a really big thing. And same with Fraze. Like you said, first AAA appearance, you're probably a little shaky. He ended up walking three, but in three innings. So not good, but not awful. But again, only one earned run. And that's the biggest part of it is that even if you walk those guys, it's about getting yourself out of trouble if you get in it. And I think both of them for young players did a good job. Barger, great to see him kind of bounce back a little bit. And then the first game, again, another bounce back by Lawrence. Hatch has been... I feel like he's been hit or miss, but not as talked about as much this year because he's more in the reliever role rather than starting pitching. So last year he was under the spotlight a little bit more as he did not perform all that great. But so far, I mean, three innings in that one, only one earned. Great to see Lawrence bounce back. And then a little bit of offense, not a ton, but a little bit, and we will take it overall. Yeah, I think Hatch has actually performed pretty nicely this year. I remember last year he was just... He was kind of 
a forgotten man. He was he wasn't getting the opportunities to start in this time. He's more of that long inning relief guy. I mean, he's three and zero. He's got a three point six five ERA in the season and twelve point one innings. He's gotten one save. He's you know only the long ball again for him is the what's killing this team in general. But he's given up two of the five earned runs he's given up. Only walked five guys. He has. Had, I think he's sitting nicely in the spot where he's going to be. The rest of his career is just that long inning relief guy that's not going to be put in any, at least in the big leagues. He might get another chance or two up on the big league club, but I, I don't think he's going to be put in a starter's role. And I don't think he's going to be put in any high pressure situations. And you can make a great career out of a long inning arm guy, because if your starting pitcher goes out early and you got to limit the damage and save your bullpen, you can go in there and pitch three, four, or five innings in relief and become a very valuable piece to the lineup. But Lawrence, I'm not exactly sure why he only went three innings pitched, but maybe that's just to get him back on track. Maybe they saw something in there and go, okay, one t- one time through the lineup, get him out, No, no issues there. His strikeouts were a bit down. I know he had, didn't he have 10 strikeouts in his last outing? That's why this three innings is a bit of a mind stretch scratcher for me but the biggest thing for the pitchers at least eight walks and i'm sorry eight walks for the the hitters they had but it was just zulu struggled four walks frage i know that was his first outing in triple a but three walks it's definitely it's not becoming overly concerning but it's something to monitor even reese one inning pitch two walks so it's it's definitely not the cold weather because they're down in gwinnett it's uh, it's definitely something to monitor with those walks. The only thing I can think of with Lawrence, I, I like you said, the last game he had, he played performed very well, and for the most part, he's gone more than three innings every single outing. The only thing I can think of is kind of the other thing you mentioned with Hatch performing pretty well, and their starting rotation not doing that great is maybe they're trying to stretch Hatch out a little bit to be maybe either long relief or try to get him also back in the starter role because right now they don't really have too many consistent starters with some of the bigger ones that they wanted to perform very well, struggling a little bit early. So maybe they're trying to stretch out Hatch a little bit to get him in a little bit more of a starting role than a relieving role. But other than that, I don't know why they would cut Lauren short on a solid performance. Yeah, and then I'll just go over the hitters real quick. Horowitz, he... Didn't come up with the amount of hits that we thought. He went one for six in these two games, but he's got three walks and three strikeouts with a stolen base. So he's keeping that walk to strikeout ratio pretty even. Bernard had his first home run of the season, two runs, one RBI, three walks in this one. He's also one for six. And then uh, Barger, like you mentioned earlier, three for three with a run. Rose's ERA quite a bit. I think he's hitting 250 now. And then uh, Schneider, 0 for 4 with three strikeouts. So you can kind of see it's a bit of a roller coaster still early in the season. You can kind of understand that with only three runs and three runs against so far in these two game series, low scoring, but pretty decent pitching, which I mean, when you walk as many guys as this pitching staff has, and you've only given up three runs for the first two games, it's not bad, but definitely you're seeing more small ball this time of year than I thought we would see this early on with the amount of players that are in the lineup. Yeah. Once again, I mean, we just see the offense struggling, which going into the season is something we were hoping would not happen, especially the way it started off very early on. A lot of these players were hitting and hitting very well. Now everyone seems to be struggling quite a bit. Again, winning two, one is not great, but okay. And then you lose two, one. So, I mean, Three runs in two games, not what you're looking for. Again, we kind of mentioned that the pitching would likely settle back in at some point. I know they had a little bit of a rough stretch, but overall, we just kind of trust the pitching at this point, especially after what we saw last year. But the hitting is what we want to continue to actually grow and be a little bit more consistent in the three, four, five range per average per game. And right now they are not doing it. And that's how you lose games by one run. And you can lose by one run if it's high scoring, but losing by one run when you only score one is not great. So, Phil, we'll move on to the BSC update here. Um, if you noticed, uh, your one guy, Nate Pearson, got called up, but you, and that's worth 15 points. But in these two games, you scored 15 and a half, and I scored 12. So I almost matched you, even with the call up. I was wondering what happened uh when i first saw the update i was like how in the world with how awful my players did did you not 
demolish me, but that makes uh, makes a lot more sense. So realistically, I got half a point is what you're trying to tell me. Yeah, uh, and that came from Horwitz on the Thursday ga- or Tuesday game where he had uh, two walks, two strikeouts, and a stolen base. So good thing he stole that base, otherwise you would have just walked out with just 15 points. Yeah, I think um, I think the season for me, I, th- I think it's just, you know, it's over. I think uh, it's uh, looking like last year. It's looking a lot like last year. I mean, do you think we should do a brief and quick, because it's our, our two-year anniversary show, what the BSC is? Because it's been... Yeah, that's a uh, good decision. It's been a little yeah, while. I mean, what we do is we love fantasy. We love the five teams we cover. So in your infinite wisdom, and that does sound sarcastic, but I'm not being, it was actually a great decision, came up with the idea of trying to incorporate all five teams together and create one giant fantasy game where we draft five players from each team. We have our own scoring system that you can check the previous. I would have to try to find the actual dates when we gave out the actual scoring breakdowns. But you, we basically evened out all the playing fields. So a touchdown and a great performance by Josh Allen can have the same numbers as a great night from Dane Smith that would have a same great night from a Tage Thompson. So it, it kind of evens out all the playing field. I think we've got the down to a science where yes, there's like 150 games in baseball and there's only 16 in football, but by the end of the year, the numbers kind of match up where everybody's scoring about the same amount. So what you do football, we draft three offensive players, two defensive players, And we just go back and forth. And when we total up that stuff for hockey, it's three forwards, two defense for the Buttes. Again, three forwards, two defense for the Bisons. It's three hitters, two defense or two pitchers. And then uh, for the Buffalo Bandits, it's three forwards and two defense slash transition players. So it's kind of it's this giant. It's hard to explain when you're not looking at it, but it's this giant web of fantasy buffalo sports action that encompasses all five teams we cover one of our favorite parts is that it's all buffalo which is a lot of fun but the other great part about it is that while the buffalo bisons are wrapping up the buffalo bills are already getting going so this yep. is a year-round one season i mean by the time this season is season two but by the time it is starting to wrap up we're already drafting for next season so there's a lot of Exciting overlap, and I don't think we ever really get a break from it, which makes it pretty interesting. Yeah, this is another part where, yes, listeners, keep coming in, keep doubling our numbers each year, because I really want to have somebody on here that just takes over this, because it's not tough work. It's just, oh, great, the Bison's played again. I got to total up all these numbers. I have to do everything by freehand right now, Phil, and I just want all this animated somehow, where like you just it pulls all the numbers from the websites and imports it in for us. And also, if we had somebody running it, we could add our fans to it, which is also an eventual goal at some point. That is the goal, too. But, Phil, here's another goal. Well, I guess I should ask, are you making any changes to said Buffalo Bisons uh, BSC team? I just don't think they're, I mean, they're struggling so much. I mean, everybody, and if Pearson gets sent back down, i got to get those yo-yo points. So for now, I'll see what Pearson is up to for Toronto. So I'm going to I'm gonna let it slide for the moment. I am also going to hold, and it is PK's Hot Corner. I did not forget this week like I did two weeks ago, I think it was, but I briefly mentioned the ABS system, the automated balls and strike system in baseball, and my Hot Corner is it's going to be more welcome than the pitch clock, and I know there hasn't been a ton of criticism with the pitch clock just because it's speeding up the game so much, and the only people that are really going to complain about it are the old, hard-nosed fans that, you know, you can't change the sport. It has to be the way it is. Even though literally every sport changes to adjust to the times and speeding up the game and making it more constant action is driving up the numbers in baseball and it's actually saving your sport. So it's going to be difficult to argue calls. You're not going to be able to because it's an automated system that calls it. It's also, I think it's going to speed up the game a bit because the players aren't going to be able to question the calls. There's no more adjusting to the strike zones each day, depending on how the umpire is calling balls and strikes. It's always going to be known. So I think it's going to benefit the hitters 
a bit more than probably the, the pitchers, but I think also the pitchers are going to be able to, if they can pinpoint the corners, they're going to get the call because the automatic strike zone is going to say, okay, that's actually a strike. I still think they need, to, they're going to be able to have to fine tune the system a bit, but it is another welcomed addition to the sport where I think it's actually going to make it quicker and more entertaining for the fans that are paying money, not just to you know watch it on TV, but be there in the stands. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely advantage hitter for the most part. I mean, you're going to get I mean, pitchers can get away with close calls when it's not automated, especially with catchers and their framing ability. I mean, we even talk about or analysts talk about some of the best framing catchers in the entire league that steal strikes all the time. So if you take that aspect out of the game, I think catching even gets affected a little bit. I don't know if you're looking for. I don't know, maybe as much of a defensive catcher. Obviously, they still need to block and still need to be able to catch runners. But at the same time, some of these catchers are so incredible at framing pitches or freezing pitches or snapping it back into the strike zone that that's something that they are, you know, on the team for is stealing strikes because that ends up meaning a lot in the long run. So taking that element out of the game and then even pitchers just not getting close calls, it'll be, like you said, automated. So I think it's definitely advantage to the hitter. I mean, there's still pitchers are still incredible with what they can do and the amount of ball movement they get. So I'm not saying hitters will never be fooled or never stand there watching a third strike. It'll still happen a decent amount or at least enough, but I definitely think it gives the advantage to the hitter. But also at the same time, you won't have, I, I would hope you wouldn't have as many discretions with balls and strikes, which sometimes we see. A you know an ump can be pretty inconsistent. Some out there, I'm not saying it's all of them, because some of them out there are extremely good at what they do, and it's mind blowing how a ump ever sees a ball or a strike when it's coming in like that, and the amount of movement they have, and knowing where across the plate, it's really impressive what they're able to do. But then some of them are so inconsistent and all over the place. So it's definitely it, it'll be interesting. Like you said, I think it'll be just a a new system a new something baseball is trying and to me that's the biggest aspect of it is that baseball is just trying to adapt finally i feel like it took forever for them to really adjust anything at all with the game they play versus other sports trying to adapt to you know a faster paced world or just you know everything that's going on in the world and entertainment and what can be you know actually entertaining for a long period of time with people shorter attention spans so it's good to see a game like this actually just trying anything. So we'll see how it goes. And I mean, I'm happy they're using AAA as just a kind of experimental league now a little bit. And I'm very interested to see just what it all like, how it all shakes out. So on our next show, we will wrap up the series between the Bisons and Gwinnett. And hopefully we get some good news to follow. But we'll move on to our final segment. Yes, only two teams talking about here because... You know, the draft is going on right now, so we can't very much talk about what we don't know yet. Everybody listening will know what happened in the first round before we do. So we'll move on to the Buffalo Bandits here. Phil, if the Bandits win, they get the top seed throughout the playoffs. If San Diego loses, Buffalo gets the top seed throughout. If both teams lose, Buffalo gets the top seed throughout. The only way the Buffalo Bandits do not get the top seed throughout is if San Diego wins and they are facing Colorado, and Buffalo loses to uh, Albany. I don't know why I just brain farted there. Ben. I don't know. You, it's just, Albany. you just stopped. <laughs> I, I, I blanked on who they were facing, Albany. So that would be the only way San Diego gets the top seed throughout the entire playoffs. And I think this is very important this year because the playoffs are a bit more condensed than they were last year, where – you would have to wait a full week to get it. This year, it's going to be Memorial Day where games one and two happen. And then the following week, you have to, uh, uh, if you're, if it's needed, a game three. So in this situation, San Diego, uh, the West Coast team, whoever is, if Buffalo makes it to the finals, are going to have to fly from West to East and then fly East to West in that same weekend. If you only have to fly you know, west to east once, it, it it's a great benefit. Or east to west once would be Buffalo. So I think this is a huge advantage this year because of the condensed schedule for the games one and two in the finals. Yeah, I know there was a little bit of talk, and I mean a very little bit, but just about how the Bandits have been this team in the championship the last two years now. And like, you know, is it 
would it be better if the Bandits were not the number one overall seed again in the league? And like, because obviously it hasn't worked out for them yet. So do you want just a different path to kind of shake things up? But I completely agree with you. I always wanted to go through Bandit land. I mean, the last series was very close. Calgary was depressing and a long time ago but I mean for the most part you just you want to be home no matter what happens you want it to be at home and like you said with the travel for the championship you absolutely do not want to have to go out west back east and then out west again if you were not the number one seed so hopefully they are able to pull it off because I agree with you I think this year more than the last few years it's a a big difference in home field advantage so for the opponents the winner of the Halifax Georgia game makes it to the playoffs. The other team is eliminated. Halifax wins. And these are the outcomes because Buffalo is locked into the number one seed in the East, but they don't know who they're facing in the first round yet. It could be any of the Rochester. It could be Georgia or it could be Halifax. So here's, here's the quick breakdown. If Halifax wins and Rochester loses, Buffalo faces Rochester in round one. If Halifax wins, and Rochester wins, Buffalo faces Halifax in round one. If Georgia wins, Buffalo faces Georgia in the first round, regardless of that Rochester game. All of those games, the Philly versus Rochester and Halifax versus Georgia, are Saturday at 7 p.m. Buffalo faces Albany at 7 p.m. Guess what I'm doing Saturday at 7 p.m., Phil? I have all three TVs set up, and I'm going to have in my basement all three games going on at the same time. I'll be live tweeting it nonstop, trying to figure out, okay, Buffalo wins, you get top seed. You know, if if Rochester wins, that eliminates them from having to come to Buffalo. And I'll, I'll just be following it nonstop and giving like quarter by quarter breakdowns because it's going to be a nerve wracking night, even though we guaranteed have the top seed and next weekend is in Bandit Land, regardless of what happens. I think one of the more interesting things about this whole thing, I mean, it all comes down to this weekend, but it's something we talked about the entire year. It goes back to the very first Albany game was we kind of mentioned every single loss is massive. And yes, it matters who you lose to, but it's not necessarily who you lose to or how you lose. Obviously, losing to the East versus West, there is a difference. I get that. But It was just the fact that every single loss is going to be magnified that much more when you're going for this top spot. And here we are once again, the Bandits are sitting at four losses the entire season. You've lost only four times, and you're coming down to the very final game to decide who gets the number one overall seed. And even last week, it came down to that game for the East, and that would just be five losses if they got there. So it's just insane how close and competitive this league can be. And then to transition into everything you just talked about, We're into the last week, and Buffalo has three separate opponents they could possibly be facing in the first round, depending on how everything goes down. And it's the very final week of the season. So it's just so interesting and so great to see a competitive league and this competitive, especially with how everything started. I mean, look at the kind of flip-flop a little bit. Rochester's still doing okay, but the flip-flop of Halifax and Rochester and even Georgia coming out of absolutely nowhere to be in the position they are so it was just a an incredible ride so far. I know we're into the last week and we still have, you know, that week to go, but there's just so many different aspects and scenarios that can play out. And I think that's a lot of fun rather than having everything set in stone headed into the final weekend. I mean, no resting your players would be kind of nice, but at the same time, I think it's a lot of fun to have this kind of wild last season or last uh, week of the season. Phil, if they do win on Saturday, it'll be the third straight season of or third straight completed season or finishing 14 and four. That's just unbelievable. And for everybody that says Johnny T needs to be let go because he can't get the team over the hump. What other coach can have their team work through the injuries they had this year and finish three straight finish seasons, 14 and four and the 2020 season that was shorted shortened, they were seven and four at that point too. So I mean, it's just it's it's mind blowing what this team has been able to do the last three full seasons, and I'm very excited to see what happens throughout the rest of the playoffs, and we'll be carrying you throughout the entire playoffs and into the off season. But we're not even going to talk about that yet because we have a game to talk about, Phil. Saturday versus Albany. Their last matchup was Week One, December third where they lost 11 to 10 somehow because the bandits outshot them 55 to 38 and some big numbers here. Kelly two, three and five uh, Tanner Thompson 
two, four, and six. He was the bandit killer. McArdle, two, three, and five. But Jamison, 45 saves for the bandits themselves. Nanakoke, three goals, three points. Kluch, two, three, and five. McKay, one, one, and two. Byrne, two, three, and five. Buchanan, two, two, and four. And then Smith had five assists. Vince, 27 saves. It was just such a weird game. And I admitted on that second show that I went into that reaction probably a bit over the top where just saying what happened to this offense just what happened I after a while I was like okay let's just throw this game out because it's such a fluke game I mean 55 to 38 in shots Jamison just stood on his head and stole the game where Buffalo's offense just couldn't get anything going who would have thought though Phil that game would be a little bit of foreshadowing what the whole season would be with such a confusing looking offense all year long even though they were so injured but still it was it was a very confusing game and I will talk to myself I don't think I handled it the way I probably should have yeah, that's all right. I mean, we there, there was a it was early. We, a wee bit. I mean, it was a long time ago. You've grown as a person since then. You know, we've gone through. I have not. Uh, don't lie. Just can you just fake it a little bit? I mean, come on. I have grown as a great person, Phil. Thank you. And we have grown with this Bandits team that we've seen fight through a ridiculous amount of adversity. And again, we kind of mentioned it all year that these are the kind of things that will build a tougher team and a championship caliber caliber team where you're winning all of these one goal games and playing without your top players and only having one game the entire season where you have a healthy front seven outside of another player that you picked up and really wanted to be part of that offense. So we really still sadly have not seen it all season, but that's kind of just what this all comes down to and for me the biggest thing with this game is just not overlooking Albany and I I, I don't know I, I <laughs> it's complicated because Albany you see their record you think they're terrible but less a little over a month ago the Rock beat them 11 to 9 so very close game very much like what the Bandits have been doing for a while April 8th not you know less than a month ago Albany beat Rochester 14 to 12 so Two massive teams that are going to be likely in play are both in playoffs. Sorry, forgot Rochester clinched. Albany was able to hang with both of them in very close two goal games. So, yes, they're not the best team. It's their last game of the season, but I could absolutely see them wanting to play spoiler quite badly because why wouldn't you want to? And like you said, their season started with Buffalo. It ends with Buffalo. I'm sure they will be amped up simply to try to make sure Buffalo is not the number one overall seed in the entire league because why would they want that? So to me, the biggest thing is just not overlooking this game. I think the offense for them and everything you just kind of mentioned, it's a massive, massive tune-up game headed into playoffs. We've only seen this offense play once, and it was against Toronto, and I think they absolutely need a full another game to just continue that momentum, continue kind of figuring things out. I think they looked much better last week, especially against the league's best defense and one of the best goalies. So I I think their momentum is absolutely in the right way, but I think the offense needs to continue to push hard in this game, not take it lightly, and just continue to, in a very weird way, practice. So, Phil, I know we have our own group chat with the Buffalo Bandits with a bunch of people that we go to the games with and that are fans of this team that will be getting their tickets again, hopefully next year with Alyssa and Joe. But I think it was one of our friends in the group chat that asked, hey, do you think we should rest some of these players going into the final game? Like, what do you think their mindset should be? And I think both of us have that same philosophy here where it's, hey, maybe in the second half, depending on the score, maybe you want to give Vince a bit of a break because he's been playing nonstop and not standing on his head. But it, it it definitely comes down to, like we said earlier, you want to win this game so you get the number one seed so you don't have to deal with the flying east to west and then back west to east in that same weekend. But for the offense itself, they've only had one game together with minus Brandon Robinson as a starting collective all year, and that was last week. I think you got to give this team the full 60 to get back in the rhythm. You want to gel before playoffs, and this is kind of, I don't want to call it a tune-up game, but it's a game to get your offense another 60 minutes working together, and I think it would be not just because of the milestones that are going to be happening where Dane Smith's still check, chasing that points record and he's still competing with Josh, or, uh, Jeff Teat for that scoring record or scoring, uh, how would you call it, the, the scoring title for this season. But 
I, I, it's just more about actually gelling as a unit and working on those small things that you haven't been able to work on all year long. So while I probably would give Maddie Vince a rest in the second half, depending on what the score is, I would not rest any of your forwards, even barring injury. And I know injuries can happen at any point. I mean, they could get hurt in the first half when you're not ready to rest them, but I mean, knock on wood, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it's it's a little different because Matt Vince has been standing on his head. He's in primetime shape. He's playing unbelievable, but the offense needs to gel before playoffs. So that's why I'm thinking with the defense and Matty Vince, maybe depending on the score, you, you give them a little bit of a break. Maybe you play uh, Steve Priola one less shift each each turn. You pull him off a little bit longer. You keep McKay on the sidelines a bit longer. You keep some of your defense a bit more healthy, but the offense, I think you can't give them any extra rest because they definitely need to gel as a unit going into playoffs where, especially with Brown one and you and I are terrified of it. Uh, one and done. Yeah. And the, the other biggest aspect of this game offense included is just don't, it's weird to say, don't play physical, but don't play physical. Don't, don't be like the absolute brawl that kind of happened between Buffalo and Toronto last week. You don't need players getting in fights. You don't need any kind of five minute majors dish out 10 Steve minute Priolo. misconducts. Steve Priolo, you don't need just any of that. And more importantly with that, like you just said, you don't want any freak injuries with players getting over physical, just be the, the bigger team for, for one game. And then you can just crank it right back up for playoffs, but just don't be insanely physical in this game. I'm not saying never hit or, you know, still play your game, play solid, play firm, but don't go way over the top like it was against Toronto. I mean, Toronto was doing it as well, so that's exactly the environment you want to be over the top. It was both teams, and it was a great game, but this is not the game to be fighting or doing anything extracurricular. Just keep it keep it clean. Keep it clean. Smarter, not harder. So let's jump into this game. Buffalo coming in fifth in the East and scoring at 11.71. Albany dead last in the league at 9.24, so you can take advantage of that. Buffalo third in the league in allowing goals at 10.65. Albany is third worst at 12.77. That's why we said this team can get exposed. But like we said, I know it was 17 games ago, but Albany did beat Buffalo last time they played each other. For the forwards, Karen McArdle, he was out last week. He was a solid out, so I wouldn't expect him back this week unless something magical happened. Marshall pa- uh, Paulus, he came back. He's on the left-hand side. Jeremy Thompson's having a, a solid season so far. Thomas Vasin. Vason, Vason, sorry, Phil, Vason. Uh, he's played in five games, two, seven, and five. And then Ethan Walker's having a solid season, 51 points. For the righties, Charlie Kitchen, again, he was out last week. Connor Kelly has kind of been leading this offense with 61 points. John Piatelli, he's up there. Tanner Thompson, who was questionable last week and didn't play. He's got 51 points on the season so far, but he was definitely the Bandits killer in the last matchup. Vason is probably who I'm most excited to see because uh, he was on the Bandits, and we were pretty fond of him when he was first here and got some playing time, and then we shipped him off, and then we lost all of our lefties, and we were like, hey, what the heck did you do? But yes, Connor Kelly, like you mentioned, probably their their biggest threat. I mean, this team, I just <laughs> been in this mood all day, apparently, but you just don't want to take them lightly. I understand looking at all the numbers. They have nobody that really jumps off that you're – truly worried about like you said Ethan Walker Connor Kelly 51 points 61 points they're decent players Tanner Thomas if he plays Thompson sorry 51 points again decent but they're not players like a you know Dane Smith or Josh Byrne or half of the Buffalo offense that is putting up pretty similar to equal points or more than that so their offense is just it's nothing to truly fear and I think the defense will be fine as far as that goes, I mean, the defense was able to control a ridiculously talented Toronto team, as was Matt Vince. So this offense, while you can't take them too lightly because you just don't want to do that with anybody, it does not scare me all that much. Yeah, for the transition and the defensive game, it's definitely like you, you, you uh... I think you summed it up perfectly. You can't take this team for granted, but you can expose them in certain situations. Colton Watkinson, he has 13 cause turnovers. John LaFontaine, he's got 17 cause turnovers. Uh, uh, Koschok, he's got 14 cause turnovers. And Chayakowski, he's got 16 cause turnovers. So those four guys are able to 
get those cost turnovers, and that gets it into the transition game where Buffalo has been very good all year long in that game. But it's definitely, that is where a, a team can expose the other team in a matchup where you're expected to lose. Albany's going in with nothing to lose. If you're being sloppy on offense, where you know, we've seen this team not being able to get the offensive chances and taking too many shots from the outside, if you're doing that and they get in trouble in the transition game and you see Albany pipe in two or three or four opportunities in the in transition game, the game can get flipped on its head very quickly. So you have to be very careful in that, you know, in between the offensive zones and you can't get killed in the transition game. And I think that's the biggest area where you're going to have to watch this weekend is if Buffalo might get too lackadaisical or too, you know, I don't want to call it lazy, but that kind of aspect of the game where they're not going full on out to win this game. I think that's the biggest area of concern for me just because of, you know, they've already clinched the top seed in the East. They, they, very well could be the top seed in all of playoffs, but it, it's that's the biggest area that I'm going to be watching on Saturday night. Yeah, and kind of what you just mentioned is still the one of the bigger areas that concerns me is just the physicality of Albany, not necessarily Buffalo, but like you said, not only do they have nothing to play for, this is their last game of the season. Like this, this is it. After this, they're yep. done until next year. So all these players. The frustration of their entire season of, you know, not making playoffs, being the not so great team that they are, they can come out absolutely swinging. And hopefully the refs are playing this one very tight because they don't want to see any unnecessary injuries. But Albany literally just has nothing to lose. And if they want to go out physical, they absolutely can because what's going to happen? Their season's over. So that's an aspect of it that scares me a little bit. I'm not saying these players are just going to be jerks and all of a sudden, you know, (laughs) just start demolishing players for no reason. But I'm sure you can also probably assume that they're pretty frustrated with their season and the way it turned out and going up against the number one team in the East, I'm sure is a good team to take some of that frustration out on. So hopefully it doesn't get too chippy, too nasty or anything. But like you said, they have nothing to lose. Their season's over, especially after this week, because it's literally done. So that worries me a little bit. So the last name we're going to mention, Doug Jamison, he is the guy that stole the Albany Firewolves game one, and he has not had the best season, but that's kind of expected with the players that are in front of him. They're a growing team, and they're going to be very good in the near future, but 3-11, and 12.43 goals against, 78 save percentage, so even though the goals against are high, his save percentage is still up there towards the league average, I would call it. He's definitely a good goalie. But I think this is one of those games where you want to get out early. And we've been saying that for how long, Phil? How many games this season you want to get out early? But I think if you can get out early and get a 5-1 lead, 5-2 lead, 6-3 lead, something like that, where you're really piping in the goals here, you're going to see a team that kind of you know, gets out of their element and gets gets in their own head in Albany and goes, hey, game's over, season's over, what are we going to do? And kind of kill their will to play is what I would call it. Absolutely. As you were describing that, that is exactly kind of how I took it. If you can get a early run and even like you said, 6-3, 4-1, something early just to show that you're on top, show that your offense is moving, they might just kind of fold it and pack it in. And like you said, their season's over. So if you get out early and kind of show that you're just going to run away with the game, they might simply hang their heads and kind of quit without actually quitting. But I mean, I think of all games, I mean, I guess of all games, I would have said last game, but now that we're on the very last game of the season, of all games, this is the game that we'd like to see them get up early, put this game away very early, continue to push, continue to rack up the goals, get your offense flowing, get some confidence in that offense, some swagger in that offense. But other than that, put this game away very, very early, get Albany, like you said, out of their own mindset. I mean, just kind of force them to realize their season's over and do it quickly. And the sooner you do, the sooner they might give up. So, Phil... Can we do it seven straight weeks? What is your score prediction for this game? I was kind of, without saying it right away, I was going to blow the doors off. What are you doing? I'm doing 13-8. All right, I was I was very, we had the eight correct. And my, my number kind of looks like a three, but I was going to go 15-8. Even though we haven't seen it, I think the offense is is motoring. I think Albany is going to give up, and I just, I really, I need to see it, I think, more than anything. I need to see an absolute 
thrashing of a not so great team. And again, this team in the last month has hung close with Toronto, hung beat Rochester. So I know we keep saying that their numbers aren't great. They're not a good team, which are both kind of true based on their numbers, but they've also hung with some of the best in the entire East very recently. So this team has it in them if they really want to to kind of hang in this game. But if the bands can get out early, I hope that the score just takes off because it's what the offense and, and I need. I need it personally. I want to see just a thrashing of a team finally, something we've been waiting for most of the year. So, Phil, final BSC changes for your Buffalo Bandits team. You got Smith, Nanako, Cloutier, McKay, Spanger. I have Byrne, Frazier, Buchanan, Priolo, and Weiss. Are you making any changes to that five-man unit? Well, now that I'm finally healthy with Nanako, I don't think we're making any changes. That's fair. I am also not making any changes as well. So we will wrap up the BSC uh, fantasy game on our next show. So, Phil, buckle up. Milestone time. Last week, though, we did miss... Max Adler, he crossed 300 career face-off wins in just two, like a season and a half, almost two full seasons. Well, it'll be two full seasons next year, January, if he comes back with the team. But congrats to him, three off, 300 career face-off wins, huge accomplishment in this league for a guy who had not played box lacrosse since until last year. Here we go, Phil. It's uh, it's time here. Dane Smith is seven loose balls away from 100 on his career. It would be the second time in his career he reached that mark. He had 111 in 2016. Kyle Buchanan, seven loose balls away from 100 for his career. Or, I did that again. 100 for the season would be the fourth time he has reached this mark. He had 100 in 2016, 131 in 2017, and 111 in 2018. Three straight seasons of that. Steve Prelo, if he plays on Saturday, it will be his 200th game played in the NLL. He would be... And, and they were all with the Bandits. He would be the fourth Bandit ever to play 200 games with the team and tie Rich Kilgore for third most in Bandits history. He was also one point away from 200 for his career. He'd be the 16th Bandit to ever record that amount with the team. Josh Byrne, one assist away from 200 for his career. He averages 2.84 a game for his career. He would also pass Ryan Banesh for fifth all-time in Bandits history. Chase Frazier, four shots away from 400 for his career. Josh Byrne is also seven loose balls away from 300 for his career. He averages 4.91 a game for his career. Ethan O'Connor is three loose balls away from 600 for his career. He averages 4.42 a game for his career. Matt Spanger, one loose ball away from 300 for his career. He averages 4.04 a game for his career. Josh Byrne, eight points away from passing Ryan Banesh for fifth place in Buffalo Bandits history in all-time points. He averages 4.92 a game for his career. He's also four shots away from passing, again, Ryan Banesh for fourth all-time in Buffalo Bandits history since they began keeping that stat. Nick Weiss, 10 loose balls away from passing Kevin Brownell for eighth place in Bandits history. He averages 5.68 a game for his career. He's also two loose balls away from setting a new career high. Max Adler, 10 face-off attempts away from passing Micah Kersey for fifth place in Bandits history. Now comes the, uh, the fun part. Josh Byrne is at 40 goals on the year. That's good for 15th most in a single bandit season. One more, he will move into a tie for 12th. Two more, he will move into a tie for 10th. With three more, tie for 9th. And six more, a tie for 8th. Dane Smith is three assists away from breaking his own assist record of 94, which he set last year for the NLL. Dane Smith, 12 points away from breaking his own record in points in a single season with 137. He is tied with Jeff Teat at 126. With five, he will have the third most in a single season in the NLL. NLL. With 10, he will move into second place, beating himself. And with five, or he has five career 12 plus point games, he can do it. With one more penalty minute, Steve Priolo will have the single season penalty minutes record for the Buffalo Bandits all to himself. He is currently tied for first place. He is also tied for 16 most in loose balls in a single band of season with one he will tie for 14th and tie his own personal best with four he will move into a tie for 13 seven tie for 12 eight tie for eighth and the final one here phil matt vince is have or does have 702 saves on the year that is eighth most in a single nll season with four he will move into a t- or move into seventh with six sixth with 11 fourth most, 15 third most, and 46, he will move into second most in a single season. But Phil, he needs 51 on Saturday to set a new NLL record for single season saves. Unbelievable. And we close out the milestones for the regular season. If the Buffalo Bandits get to 13 goals 
we're going to go on the lighter side and go with yours. Does Dane Smith break both records? I think he's breaking the assist record, but I sadly don't think he's going to break the points record, but I also don't think Jeff Teat will either. I agree. I think both of them in this game, it's going to be very interesting because they both have the ability to put up an insane amount of points in one game. And if they were going to, I think both of them would do it in this game because they're both playing easier teams. So it'll be interesting. I, I, I agree. I don't think they either get to the points, but it's insane that Smith will likely once again beat his own assist record that already shattered the previous assist record by quite a bit that he just keeps topping. I think next year we're going to really aim for that 100 assist benchmark. I mean, he could do it this game. He, he, he very well could do it. That's actually extremely true. So I guess if there's one thing I'd like to see, it's Dane Smith reach the 100 assist benchmark and crush his own previous record. This year or next year? <laughs> this year. Yeah, this year or next year. That's what I mean. What? Oh, I, I didn't know you transferred it. You said the one thing you really want to see is the 100 points. I wasn't sure if you meant just this year or in general. <laughs> No, yeah, I want to see him get to uh, 100 assists in this next game That's with, fair. with That's the Bandits fair. W and number one overall seed. So, Phil, my only last question with all this, and I'll let you talk for a bit because I rambled on about the milestones. Out of the three possibility of teams that are you know, on the docket for the Buffalo Bandits for round one, Rochester, Halifax, Georgia, which... What's your order of wanting to face them all the way down to not wanting to face it? One through three and one being who you want, three being who you would rather not see. Well, the uh, I believe it was IL Indoor just had their five up, five down, and two of the ups were the goaltenders for Georgia and Rochester. So that's not ideal. Uh, so I think to me right now, Georgia might be the scariest team of those three simply because they are on an absolute tear. They are a huge comeback story the entire season. So I think that one, I feel like they just have a lot of momentum on their side, especially in a one and done. You just never know what's going to happen. Their goalie's playing very well. They have the kind of dynamite players that can take over a game. So they're, they're scary, I think, right now with everything kind of clicking and the way their season has gone. So for me, they'd be the team I don't want to play at all. Rochester probably next because I think Hartley is also starting to really heat up. I don't think they really have the dynamic Dane Smith type player, but I mean, Counterfields, we know he's very talented and he can do what he wants to do. So they do have a pretty solid offense. And then Halifax is pretty hit or miss. They've been up or down all season. I think they have an insane amount of talent that is also playoff and battle tested. So I think they will still be a very solid playoff threat, but at the same time, I just don't think they're rolling quite as much as the other two are. Uh, we both have the same number three. I don't want to face Georgia whatsoever just because of two names, Brett Dobson, who's playing unbelievable in that. I think he's probably in line for the rookie of the year because of the the <laughs> the unbelievable run that Georgia's been on. Him and a couple other rec rookies around the league, but Dobson has just stood on his head in net and the second one's Lyle Thompson, and he's really good at lacrosse, and I don't want to face him. I am flipping the one and two, though. I think I would rather see Rochester than Halifax in a one-game series just because I think you can get to Ryan Hartley early. I think Halifax just has – and I, the both teams have really solid offensive firepower. But I think Rochester, if you're able to contain Connor Fields – put a big body guy on. I know we added like 15 pounds of muscle or something he said in the off season. So he can kind of be bad battle tested in the playoffs, but he kind of came up short in the playoffs last year for the Buffalo Bandits. I know he was like the third or fourth option for this team, but he kind of came up a bit short and he was not doing what we kind of expected after a big breakout season. If you can put a big body guy on him and just body him up, I think he'll shrink in the playoffs because you know, playoffs refs tend to swallow their whistles so if you can body him up I don't think he's the same player and I don't think the offensive unit is the same I think Halifax is just lined up with such veteran presence on the offensive unit that they're used to it they're they're battle tested I mean they took Toronto to overtime last year I don't want any piece of that so I'd rather have Rochester out of all the teams which means 
we got to root for Halifax and root for <laughs> Rochester to lose to Philly. What we're really saying is that anything it's can ter- happen in a terrifying. one and done, and it's all scary. Yes, big time. Big time. <laughs> So I am going to be watching all three games in my basement at the same time and just be a nervous wreck the whole time, even though it's just for the number one seat, but it's also for who the Buffalo Bandits will be facing. So Phil, is there anything else you want to add to this episode before we shut it down? Watch the rest of the draft and get ready for Saturday night. No, you can uh, you can shut it down. That's good because uh, Houston traded up to three, so they had the second and third pick. Three quarterbacks went in the top four, and Anthony Richardson just went the uh, the Indianapolis Colts. That's a quick rundown of where we are. And uh, you can kind of time this up if it's 8.42 when we're ending this up. But thank you all for listening, or I guess I should start. Next show, we will cover the Buffalo Bandits versus Albany game, who they're going to be facing the first round. Did they end up with the number one seed? We will wrap up the Buffalo Bison series versus Gwinnett, and we will go over all the draft picks and maybe even a couple trades for the Buffalo Bills on our Monday show. So thank you all for listening to another episode of the Buffalo Sports Collective, and thank you for an awesome last two years. We're going to keep pumping out these episodes. Follow along with us on Facebook and Instagram at Buffalo Sports Collective and on Twitter at Buffalo Sports Co. Visit our website at buffalosportscollective.com. Subscribe to our channel wherever you listen to podcasts, and make sure you leave us a review on Apple and Spotify. Until next time, bye-bye.